What's up, y'all? I don't know if you guys have got a chance to see, uh, watch you guys watch a lot of YouTube, but I got a channel called Fresh Out Life After Penitentiary. My name is Big Herc, and I started the channel about five years ago to try to educate the people on prison, um, just different things as far as uh, the culture behind the prison system and just how horrible it is, and, and just share my experiences and have other guys share their experiences to be more positive role models. Um, <clears throat> I don't glamorize prison. I, you know, we do have a lot of you know, crazy questions on there that people ask, but for the most part, I try to be educational and somewhat keep it entertaining. So the channel's called Fresh Out Life After Penitentiary. It's on YouTube. We got a lot of videos, a lot of people on there, a lot of cool stuff. And um, that's kind of like what I have going on. But a little background on myself. Um, I grew up, man, my mom had me pretty young. So I know a lot of people go through a lot of adversity. So, you know, it's just part of life. But my mom had me about 14. So I didn't get to know my dad. I never met my dad. I lived pretty much with my mom and my grandparents. So I was raised in a household where my grandmother was kind of like a mother figure to me. And, um, you know, for the most part, I didn't have, didn't have a lot of trouble growing up. You know, did good in school, um, was a straight A student. You know, I never, I never took pride in getting bad grades because to me, bad grades is like, it, it just basically represents the bottom of the barrel. In life, you know, I grew up on a military base during that time, so in life, you have to try to be the best you can be. Getting Ds, FCs, it don't cut it. Unless you want to be working for somebody for the rest of your life or you want to be somebody else looked up as a servant or somebody's underling, then, you know, those bad grades might do you good. But to me, you know, I always took pride in getting A's. I felt like it was, it was a badge of honor. So I always got good grades in school. You know, I used to skateboard. I BMXed. Um, break dance and break dancing was big. I used to perform at, you know, a couple of different events. And, you know, I was into the stuff that like young people do, never really got into any trouble, like I said, um, at that point. And, you know, just play sports and stay pretty active all the way up until probably the ninth grade. And in the ninth grade, you know, I got around, I moved, my mom got divorced, moved to the hood, you know what I mean? We were living on a street where there was a lot of ex felons, a lot of dudes from the penitentiary. Um, a lot of gang activity, a lot of drug dealing, a park down the street with a drug park. And I used to see this stuff every day. And, you know, even though I was playing sports and I was still getting straight A's, I was in, as a freshman, I was taking um, Spanish class, I was taking trigonometry, I was taking uh, chemistry. I was taking a lot of good classes, I was getting good grades. But, you know, um, I wanted to, I felt like I was missing something. My mom was working hard, you know, I had a brother and sister to take care of. And I felt that um, I had to step my game up. And at that point, the straight A's and stuff didn't seem like it was really doing me any good. I've been getting straight A's my whole life. So I felt like, man, maybe it's time I need to step into the game and start hustling. So the summer of going from, the, from my freshman to sophomore, I got into the dope game. You know, bought my first piece of crack rock, sold it, you know, made 20 bucks. Going back, made 40 bucks, made like two, 300 bucks in a day. You know, I had a rush. I was 14 and a half, 15. I had a pocket full of money. I told my homeboy I wouldn't flip his money for him. And I'm selling drugs to grown people, people who are old enough to be my, my dad, some of them maybe my grandfather, and I'm slanging it. You know what I mean? I'm a 15-year-old, and I'm, you know, I'm riding around. I'm on 10 speed slanging dope. And um, <clears throat> you know, I did that for a lot of the summer. I'm hustling. My mom would go to work. She wouldn't know what I was doing. I'd be watching my brother and sister. I'd come outside my house. All I had to do was walk outside, and I can make like two, 300 bucks, you know, and for being 15, that was a lot of money. So it was like a rush, you know what I'm saying, selling dope to these grown men, knowing that you know, they, they had to pay me for this, for this piece of rock. And uh, you know, a lot of times you get, at that age, you get challenged. So you have people who might want to jack you. You got guys who, you got to worry about the police. You know, we used to ride around, I used to have a Rambo knife on me, and my homeboy had a 22. So we would switch off carrying the different, the different, uh, the different gats, you know, or he carried a gat or I carried a knife, or we switch up just because we didn't want to get robbed by these older dudes who were, you know, a hard, I'm talking about hardcore motherfucker, Jerry Curls, you know, penitentiary dude drinking 40s. We'd be out there. I didn't drink 40s. You know, I wasn't over there shooting dice and nothing, but I'd just be kind of kicking it, selling dope. And I'd be, you'd have to compete. There might be a car pull up and it'd be five to eight people or 10 people rush the car. And so you had to try to hustle with these dudes and everybody was out for themselves. And this was a doggy dog. 
But this is what I did when I was 15. So I got into that grown man mix at a young age. Lo and behold, doing that hustle, got caught up with the homies and got hit by the task force coming from the park. Got arrested, you know what I mean, went to juvenile hall. And from juvenile hall, I had to end up doing like six months, you know what I mean? And that was my first stint with jail at 15. So my sophomore year, I spent half the year in juvenile hall. And I went from juvenile hall to the boys ranch, which is a program where it's kind of like, instead of sending you to CYA, California Youth Authority, you go to the boys ranch. And the boys ranch, you know, back then, this was in the 80s, you know, these dudes, is, this, it's hardcore gang banging. Bloods, crips, you know what I mean? It's just straight banging. I mean, you can't be no soft dude up in there. You're taking open showers. You ain't got no privacy. You got a bunk over here. I've seen people get hit in the head with a lock and a sock. I've seen dudes get slapped up in the shower, get knocked out in the shower. I mean, and you know, the average kid, see, when we were growing up, everybody was physical, working out, you know, lifting weights was a big thing. So at 15, I was hitting 225. You had dudes in there. My homeboy, my big homie, was hitting like 315. This other cat, he was hitting like 350. I mean, and they, these dudes was knocking dudes out. Wouldn't know, you know, it was straight, you know, you, you get out of pocket, you're going to put hands on you. And so juvenile hall kind of was a wake up, but it wasn't a wake up because I had a lot of bitterness in me because of just my situation. My mom, you know, didn't come see me when I was in there. You know, um, I was dealing with like a lot, a lot of family stuff and I just felt like kind of somewhat abandoned. But then at the same time, like, this is not what I wanna, where I want to be, but I didn't have anything else as far as the point of reference where I wanted to go. So I did my time in juvenile hall, <clears throat> got out. My mom got married. We moved. We moved to OC. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Orange County. So we moved to OC. Now, OC is a bubble. You know, when I was living at in Sacramento, which is North Highlands, which is my little, my little neighborhood, everybody kicks it. See, out here, it's different, man, for you guys down south. You guys are predominantly Hispanic. Well, up there, Hispanics and blacks kick it. So, you know, you might have a, a, a Hispanic or Mexican guy, and he, he's saying the same, like, what's up, my in? You know, we all family. So it's different. So we kick it, you know, white, white guys, Asians, Samoans, we all family. It's different up north. You get down south, it ain't like that. You got Serenos and you got the blacks. You know what I mean? Southsiders and the blacks. It's no mixing like that. It's totally different. And that kind of blew me away because I was used to, I'd never seen race. I, I used to kick it with the, the white homies. i kick it with the Mexican homies. I, my homeboy, I'd stay at his mom's house, eat tamales and breakfast, and we kick it. It was family. We never, I never tripped. So when I got down south, totally different. The school I went to was in Huntington Beach, predominantly white school, maybe four black kids and maybe four or five Mexicans. So we all hung together. Now, the, the black kids didn't really hang because they were kind of like OC type kids. So they weren't really, they were black, but not black. The Mexicans there, we were cool, and we, because we all worked together. We worked at Chuck E. Cheese. That's when I got my first job. So 15 and 6, 16 years old, I'm working at Chuck E. Cheese, working my first legitimate job, and I'm going to keep it real. It sucked. My paychecks weren't shit. Excuse my language. I wouldn't make, it no, wouldn't make the drug money like I used to. And, you know, I'm just in this environment. I feel like an outsider, you know, because everybody's white. I'm black. You know, I don't really have anybody to relate to. I don't have, you know, people to talk to as far as, my background or or my interest so i felt like i was just i hated it you know i hated it man so the whole time i was down there you know trying to play sports trying to fit in it was hard but you know it taught me a life lesson about you're gonna feel like that and it's good to feel like that because it makes you uh get comfortable with actually being on society you're not going to be around your homies all the time you're not going to be around your neighborhood all the time if you want to really get out and make something of yourself in life you're going to have to get outside your comfort zone but at the time, I didn't understand that. I didn't, I didn't realize my potential or who I was while I was living in Huntington. So the whole time I lived there, I just worked, hung out, you know what I'm saying, kicked, you know, just re basically didn't really have a social life too much. Sports kind of sucked because the coaches were prejudiced, you know, so I didn't really get, to, you know, they didn't want to let me play in the sports games. But anyways, as soon as I got a chance to graduate, my mom and I moved to the East Coast. And, you know, at that time, I was turning 18, they didn't actually give me a formal invite, so I felt like they were pretty much moving on. I had to figure out where I was going to go. I, didn't have, I couldn't afford to live in Huntington because it was too expensive. So naturally, I um, asked my grandparents if I could go and live with them back in Sacramento. Sacramento was a bad move, man. Going back to Sac, 18 years old, um, 
as soon as I get back, you know, we're on us banging. You know what I'm saying? We're, it's, I'm out there just like repping the hood. You know, I got a 380. I'm, I'm hanging out, you know, trying to sell dope again here and there, but trying to go to college too. But at the same time, trying to figure out what I'm going to do. You know, I want to go to school and play ball, but at the same time, I need money. You know, there's really not no jobs. I don't want to, you know, the jobs that were offered to me were slave jobs, you know, <clears throat> in my, my opinion. And I just wanted more for myself. So it just was a confusing period of time. You know, being young, trying to figure out, you know, what you want to do, you know, how resources, um, being able to have, uh, you know, money in your pocket, you want to date girls. It's a lot of stuff going on. So, I, like I said, I got caught up in the mix, gang banging, got into a fight at, you know, you know got into a couple, uh, like, major, uh, like, rumbles with, with a bunch of dudes, you know, fighting downtown, blood versus Crips, and then got into a dude at the movie theater over, I believe it was watching, like, Boys in the Hood, dude hit me, took off running, you know what I mean, I tried to catch him and, 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 hit, and knock him out, but then he ran to his car, he pulled out an Uzi, I backed up, you know what I mean, luckily, it wasn't my time to go. I hit the ground. He sprayed the Uzi in the parking lot. He hit like a cop and a girl in the background. Then he got a high speed chase and took off. He got arrested. He ended up going to the pen, I heard. So this was my summer. So I was already, it was just, I was, in a, I was on a, a path of just negativity. And it was eventually going to lead to something. And it did lead to something because my mind wasn't right. And my choices that I was making at the time were not the highest choices. A homie came up to me, hey, man, I got a lick for us. We can rob this drug dealer. You know, he's got a bunch of weed, he's got money, blah, 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 blah. You know, I just need to ride over there. So I'm thinking, oh, man, you know, it might be a quick come up. You know, quit me and, you know, we roll over there real quick. He go, go in the house and rob him, come out. You know, it always seems like it's a quick come up. It's never a quick come up, man. He went up in the house, you know, the robbed the dude. He's up in there. He's in there, you know, doing a bunch of other crazy shit. You know, I'm like, dude, what the hell's going on? I go, I go to try to tell him to come out. And basically now... I'm part of the robbery inside because I went and tried to tell him to come out. Well, I said, man, let's get up out of here. You know, this dude, he, was, he wasn't wrapped too tight anyway. I should have been a better judge of character. But we get away, and this dude gets caught like a couple months later stealing uh, CDs at uh, Tower Records. He tells about everything else and incriminates me, and basically <clears throat> um, me and another homeboy get snitched on, and I end up going to CYA. So what happened? I get arrested. I'm 18. Trying, I was going to college. I just finished my first semester. I had got out the dope game. I was just like playing sports and just doing little bullshit hustling, selling weed. And um, and I'm going to CYA, man. I got I got sentenced for uh, the home invasion. And, you know, I had an M number. So I could have went to the state pen or I could have went to CYA. And they sent me to CYA because the judge felt that it would be better so I wouldn't become institutionalized. I wouldn't get around that criminal element. The county... Everybody up in there is riding. See, you see, the thing about like North Sac County, all bloods, they bang, we banging up in there hard. And you got, you know, you got the Crips up in there, they banging hard. And then you got North Daniels, they banging hard. And ain't no Serranos or Southsiders up in there. Not on the main line. Just like down here, there is no North Daniels main line in LA County. So it was all politics. That's we start seeing the politics. The white guys don't talk to the blacks can't pass food, you can't share different things, you can't, none of that. Or you'll get disciplined by your own race, and then on top of it, you might get disciplined by somebody else. So it's just, it's just I started seeing just the level of racism on top of it. You know, people think, oh, going to jail, man, it's, it's not that bad. You, you want somebody to tell you to squat and cough and look in your, in your butt? You like people looking, you know, lifting your nuts up five and six times a day? You want somebody to tell you when to eat, when you can shower, when you can lock it down, when you can uh, basically change your clothes, when you can change your bed, go to jail. You're going to get all that. And the cops in there, you look at them wrong, they will bust your head, split your wig. I've seen female COs. What are you looking at? Oh, we got one right here. And you don't even do nothing. I've seen some big, swole cops, country corn fed, beat dudes down. And all you do is stand there. You can't do nothing. Because if you look and act like you're going to be anything in the mix, and you're going to get your wig split too. So this is what I experienced 18 years old. So I, I see all this, and I'm like, God damn, this shit is crazy, man. So I go from county jail, I go to the CYA holding facility, and they send me to Preston. Preston's like gladiator school. A lot of shit going on up in there, a lot of gang banging. I mean, and in YA, pray you guys don't ever have to go there. You don't want to go there. As soon as you hit the main line, it's cracking. Where you from? Where you from, cuz? 
Where are you from, blood? Oh, homie, where are you? As soon as you say something that don't fit, they're jumping over the counter. They're taking off on you. It's takeoff on site. YA is straight. It's worse than, it's, it's takeoff on site. Youngsters don't care. And YA goes from 13 to 25. You can max out. They don't, they don't play up in there. So as soon as you get up in there, they're testing you how you walk. You got a little switch. Oh, man, that dude's sweet, man. Them dudes, they're going to try to bust your cheeks. Yeah, them dudes up in there, after they get in wide eight, they're, they're tough like They don't play around. Dudes will exploit that shit quick because they're youngsters. They ain't been around girls. They don't know how to act as men. It's straight animals. So you're dealing with all this different stuff on top of it. Just it's like a mini, it's just like a, it's like a mini concentration camp, you know, and it's dorm living. So sometimes when they lock it down, everybody, I mean, people act like they sleep. You got to keep your eye open because you don't know if this dude you were having problems with in the chow hall is going to come and try to knock you out in your sleep. They do it's stuff like that going on all the time. But this is CYA. So I, I ended up going from Preston. Um, they transferred me to a fire camp. So I got lucky in that aspect. I went to a fire camp, Washington Ridge, which is up north. So I went to the fire camp. I was there. Um, we, we fought fires and stuff like that. I got to work in the kitchen. I got into bodybuilding, um, got into art, started drawing more. I used to draw a lot when I was a little kid, so I started drawing again. And um, I actually, one of, the, one of the counselors there was a bodybuilder, so she got me into bodybuilding and let me compete in the contest and actually won the contest, which was cool. So with, with prison food, top ramen, chilies, and garbage, you know, prison rice, and just nutrition was horrible, and, but we were able to get packages. So it, it's like it kind of gave you a sense that you still had outside interaction. But that was my first experience really competing, um, bodybuilding, and, and having somewhat of a positive experience. But at the same time, I still didn't have a mentor. You know, my family at that time living on the East Coast, you know, I did get one family visit. Um, I made friends in there, but, you know, having somebody older to lace you up on what's going on with life and just goals and, 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 and basically uh, putting together your challenges, it's still, it's confusing. So I got out of YA, went back to um, Orange County, um, got like a couple just bullshit jobs, you know, working because I was banned from Sacramento. See, there's a lot of times you don't realize that if you catch a case in a certain city, they can say you're not allowed to go back there. So I couldn't go back to Sacramento. If I got caught in Sacramento County, it was a violation of my parole. So I would go right back to jail. So I had to get out of Sacramento. I couldn't even, I, I spent like two, two hours there. And when I got out, said hi to my grandfather, my mom and him, and I took off. So that was why I went back to Orange County. I went out to Orange County, worked out there for a little bit, you know, hustled, you know, did a bunch of like odd, odd end jobs. And then I ended up going back to college up in the Bay Area. And I was doing my thing in college. I finished up another two semesters. I was like one semester away from my AA. Still getting good grades, you know, still getting good grades, doing, you know, doing good in school, working, you know, being square. And I uh, got a weed plug in there. So naturally, because my street sense kicked in, started slinging weed. So I'm slinging weed, going to college. And then eventually I stopped going to college and just keep slinging weed because I like the money. I've always been addicted to making money. So once I got to start making the money, stopped going to college. And eventually I moved back down to Southern California with my a girlfriend and became my fiance. We're living together. I'm doing some other stuff. I'm hustling. And I still have a street mentality because in between me moving back to Southern California and hustling, selling weed and sending weed through the mail, doing all kind of crazy stuff, I'm still like doing street stuff too. I'm robbing dudes. You know what I mean? I'm fucking jacking dudes. I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm selling different things. I mean, I don't I don't just keep it real. I don't sold everything, whether it be crack, meth. Um, I ain't sold heroin, but guns, you know, whatever I can get my hands on. You know what I mean? I used to hustle. That's what I did. But so my mentality was still stuck on that street grind, you know? So when a, another dude approached me, once again, my thought process wasn't right because I had been on this path. I entertained a bank robbery. And this is when I got my head busted. You know, I entertained that bank robbery. And instead of discussing it with somebody to say, hey, is this a good idea? I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and do this lick and I'll come up and then I can flip that money in the game and blah, 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 blah. But it's always a blah, 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 because it doesn't work out like that. So we did the bank robbery. High speed chase, Thousand Oaks, California. You know, people see it on the news all the time and I see them like, man, you're never going to get away. Well, it was the same shit with us. We were riding, switched cars, you know, police uh, caught us, you know, leaving the bank. Police chased us, you know, ended up 
timing, they came out, we were in the bank a little too long. In the movie, they always looked like you could be in there for 10 minutes. It happens like a flash, you know, and people say, oh, bank robbery, you will, yeah, this is an armed bank robbery. I had a ski mask on my face. I had a, a carbon, a, a M1 carbon uh, rifle. Um, I laid everybody down in there. The homie jumped over the counter, took the money bag, you know, and we basically broke up out of there, and it was a high-speed chase. Car got basically uh, spike stripped on a freeway, helicopters, there were probably 20 cop cars, raining. I jumped out the car. They let the cane on, on, the, on the other guy. I jumped out the car, jumped over the fence. I ran across the freeway. I don't know how I made it across the freeway during traffic. I made it across the freeway. They caught me on the beach. I was trying to figure a way to hide and get somewhere. I wouldn't go nowhere. Anyways, I got caught. That was the last time I seen the streets for the next eight years, eight months in the feds. From there, I went to the feds. So I'm in the feds now. You know what I mean? I'm looking, I actually got sentenced to 120 months. And when I'm sitting in the, in the, in the holding facility, I'm trying to figure out, now this is like, this is it, man. I'm going to be gone for like a decade. Um, how did I get here? You know, was it just entertaining the bank robbery? No, it was all the choices I made leading up to entertaining the bank robbery that got me in the feds. And you get in there and you see right away, once again, the politics. Serrano's over here, Blood's over here, Crips over here. You know what I'm saying? The white guys over here, Asians over here, everything's segregated. You know, you can't sit with these guys and eat. You can't, um, you might be able to talk a little bit. The feds is a little bit different than the state because you have a lot of educated guys. Most guys are educated hustlers, so they're drug dealers, so they're actually, uh, they're making money. It's not like the state where you just have a lot of people, maybe assault and battery rape and just stupid stuff that, you know, th they, they never had anything in life. A lot of guys in the feds were millionaires. So, you know, I ended up doing my time in the feds, eight years, eight months. But when I got the Lompoc USP, I seen guys in there, you know, um, 50 years, 30 years, five lives plus 100. I met a dude who had five lives. He got one life off of him on appeal. He still had four more. You know how long it's going to take him to get four more lives? It took him like seven years to get the life off, one life. So they made sure he wasn't getting out. And like, you know, and if you don't talk, you don't go to jail and talk about your case. Oh, yeah, I was in there slanging drugs. I had kilo, blah, blah. You're quiet. You just kind of, you got to read people. You say little things and you try to fill them out. Oh, what you in here for? Oh, okay, all right. But you don't get too nosy. They might think you're popo. They might think you're a rat. They might think that you're, you're trying, you know, get, get a, get a uh, 5K on your sentence, which means you're trying to get a time reduction because you're going to snitch about a murder, anything. So people don't really talk. So while I was in there, you know, I met a lot of dudes, a lot of sharp dudes, a lot of killers, man. A lot of dudes who have bodies on their cases. Like you talk to a dude and you'd be kicking it, blah, 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 blah. Because I kicked with everybody, you know what I mean? Because I was able, because the way I, I carried myself. And uh, another reason is because I did legal work. When I got to prison, because I was pretty much, I, I, was, I had a studious still mentality. I still had the, the scholarly mentality. I went to the law library and I studied. So I was able to read a lot and guys would come to me, uh, Mexican guys. Uh, black guys, you know, um, white guys, and say, hey, man, can you read this for me? Can you help me with this? So I helped a lot of people with their cases, and that's how I made my money. I would hustle. I would hustle legal work, typing, um, doing research, helping people try to get out of jail. And so I was able to communicate with a lot of different people, and a lot of blacks didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that I kicked it outside my race and that I had conversation for a skinhead or had conversation for this old white guy, ex-Vietnam veteran, you know, or I had conversation for this guy. They didn't understand it. So I caught a lot of slack for that, but because of my size and the way I carried myself, they didn't want to see me. If they wanted to see me, we'd go up in the room and, and it's, it's, you handle your business. See, and you, when you're in prison and somebody disrespects you or there's an issue, you got to go handle it right away. Because if anybody hears you, you know, somebody call you a bitch out in public or disrespect you or whatever, and you don't do nothing, it's open season. They're going to pick you apart, man. You know what I mean? You will be, you'll be butt naked by the end of the week because you have no, nothing left as far as humanity wise, because they're gonna pick you apart. Cause guys in there doing a lot of time are master manipulators and they're gonna have you, they're gonna basically see how they can exploit you. And if you come in there and you're from a certain neighborhood or you're, you're Hispanic and you're maybe, you're from this block, oh, you gotta, that's the homie right there. Hey homie, where you, okay, you gonna ride with us. You don't wanna ride, they might roll your ass up. So you got a dude in there telling you what to do, not on top of the COs telling you what to do. The correctional officers, so you got a bunch of people telling you what to do every day. Go, let's go to the yard. You got to go to the yard. Hey, homie, you got you to carry the equipment today. You got to carry the knife. 
You know what I mean? Hey, homie, you got to go over here and do this. You got to do this. You can't even, when you go take a, a dump, you got to have somebody watch out for you because you don't want to get rushed on the toilet. That's what, what, that's what you deal with when you're in the USP. And like I said, it's all politics. You got Bay Area sitting over here. You got LA over here. You got the Bloods over here. You might have the Hawaiians over here. You got the Northaniels over here. You got the Serenials over here. And you, the white boys over here. Everything's separate. And you think that life is hard in here. Life is horrible in prison. And I know guys, I still keep in touch with guys that I've gotten out with. I knew uh, white guys. I knew one of the presidents of the Hells Angels. Me and him still cool. Big, I mean, a big dude, big, heavy, heavy hitter in the game. I knew the sergeant of arms for the Mongols. A South, he's a Serenio. Been through a lot of shit, knows a lot of people. Still hits me up to this day. We still chop it up. Cool dude. But because I had respect, and a lot of people didn't have that respect, so they weren't able to cross these lines like I did. But I had respect because of the way I carried it, and I was educating myself, and I was educating other people, and I wasn't in there trying to be the hardest dude or running around trying to be a tough guy. But that's how I did my time. So I did my time like that by networking with people, but also getting my mind right and never becoming institutionalized. See, once you become institutionalized, like the homie you see coming in and out, you're done. When you think that prison is better than the street because you don't have to pay rent, you don't have to pay car insurance, you don't have to pay mortgage, you don't have to buy groceries, you get free meals, you don't have to worry about taking care of your kids, then that's going to become your home because it's the easy way out. And see, the thing is, when you go to prison, you don't know what you're going to have when you come out. See, a lot of times people get out and think, oh, man, I'm a G now. Bob, the homies going to bless me. Man, them dudes, is, they, don't, they don't moved on. You ain't got nothing coming. You know, I got out to halfway house, eight years, eight months. South Central was where I, they, they basically sent me to. I was trying to go to Hollywood halfway house. They sent me to South Central. The counselor didn't like me because I did a lot of legal work, so they figured by sending me to South Central, maybe I'd get caught up. And I was in a thick of thing. I was right by Nickerson Gardens. After 9 o'clock, if you were outside, you'd get your wig split. I mean, it wasn't, no, it wasn't no joke out there. I was out there and basically didn't have a job. I had a little bit of money saved up. I had wrote a couple books in prison, so I had published a book at this time. I was hustling the book I published and um, just trying to, trying to get, get, you know, get on my feet. Luckily, I had a homeboy I grew up with. He hooked me up with a job. I used to catch the bus every day to North Hollywood, and I gradually worked my way out of that environment. But... You know, for a lot of people, I've seen guys in there who did 20 years. Dude, they're tore up. Technology, when I went in, there was no the cell phones were old school. Um, now they had these earpieces in. I thought everybody was crazy. I'm like, what the hell? People are talking to themselves, man. I don't know what the hell's going on. I didn't know about the earpieces, the, the texting, the emailing, all this thing, all this stuff changes. So you go and sit around and do prison time. You come out, you think, oh, okay, I'm in shape. I'm still, no, nah, man, there's a lot of other things that you're being left, you, you don't left behind. So you're playing catch up. So I had to play catch up my first couple years just to get on my feet. And so once I finally got on my feet, I was able to kind of make some moves. But the whole time I was in there, I also thought about, like, what, when I, what am I going to do when I get out? You know, what, what can I do? I don't want to go and get humiliated and try to go work at Walmart and have some little young dude telling me what to do or, or people ask me about my background and all this stuff. Because you've got to say a lot of times they do background checks to ask you if you're an ex-felon, if you've been convicted of a crime. And you, you gotta do, if you don't tell them, Sometimes you can get away with it, but when they find out if they don't like you, they can fire you because you wasn't being honest. And if you're honest, they can still not hire you because there's somebody else without a felon, they can hire instead. So that's what you're looking at. So while I was in, I thought about, man, when I get out, I want to get into the entertainment business, and I'm going to come out with a show because I uh, call it, like, Fresh Out. Because I used to see guys in there watching cops. And I'm like, God damn, these guys are in prison and they're watching cops. Who does that? How can you guys watch cops, man? These dudes, that's why you're in here. But I'm like, okay, I got to not think like how I'm thinking, I got to think like how the populace think. So I'm like, I'm going to come out with Fresh Out, and I'm going to show guys when they get out and how they transition. Some will be successful, some won't be successful. Some will make it, some won't make it, you know. It all just depends on the mentality of that individual. So I got out, hooked up with my business partner. I met him at the gym when I was catching a bus from the halfway house. And a year, a couple years after that, we ended up coming up with the show and started filming the show, which I have today, called Fresh Out, Life After the Penitentiary. I also got a show called Prison Talk. We, people email us questions and stuff like that. And then I got a show called Prison Spreads. We're cooking with prison food, top ramen, tuna fish, uh, beef sausage, cheese, this garbage. But I mean, people like that stuff. So we entertain you guys with that stuff too. But that's what I did and how I got to where I was at now. But luckily I wasn't, you know, I didn't have any habits. Um, I was able to stay focused and 
in spite of doing all the time, I was able to get back on my feet. But like I said, a lot of guys didn't make it. My co-defendant who jumped over the counter at the bank, he, uh, he got out and he actually, he was like, he became mentally, he became mentally um, unstable. And he was living on Skid Row downtown. And I was watching the news one morning with my wife and I looked at the TV, that's him. He got shot five times by LAPD. They said he reached for the gun and they smoked him. He's dead. My other crimey who was a car, who drove the car in a bank robbery, he caught lupus. Lupus, a, a disease, and he died. So I'm the only one alive from that whole situation. So I consider that a blessing. So I feel like I have like a moral duty to share something out of that, you know, bank robbery because I terrified a lot of people. You know, people were, you know, people probably had nightmares behind that. Like I have nightmares about being and doing time. So, you know, this is my way of giving back with Fresh Out, with talking to you guys, with trying to, you know, educate you on just something more positive. You know, you got to think outside the box, man. I mean, I know sometimes you look at your surrounding environment. I used to do the same thing. I used to be like, man, I want to have the nice car. I want to be able to travel and I want different things. But like, how do you get those things? You know, sometimes you got to look outside your initial circle and just find people who have the same goals you have. Don't let anybody tell you you can't be something you want to be just because of where you came from. You know, because society is becoming not no more. It's, it's, it's racial, but it's becoming economics. Poor down here, rich up here. In the middle, they're barely making it. So it's not about you being, me being black, you being Mexican, or uh, you know, El Salvadorian, whatever the case you is, it's just about people and working together and trying to help each other so we can all make a decent living in life and be prosperous. Because nobody wants to be homeless. Nobody wants to live in their car. You know, I, I was almost homeless. When I got the halfway house, I mean, if I wouldn't have been able to hustle, I didn't have a place to live. My family didn't come out when I, when I got out of prison and, oh my God, you're out, here's a thousand. Oh. No, the homie hooked me up. A Mexican homie hooked me up from the pen with his Cadillac that he had, that he let his sister, you know, let me borrow, use and pay, make payments. Another homie sent me a couple of G's so I can get some clothes. So I built all these relationships through friendships in prison. My celly was also Mexican, which a lot of black people didn't like because they're like, oh, how you sit, you know, selling up with a Mexican guy. And like I told you, it's different up north. So we carry, it's not about race. And a lot of times the people promoting that are ignorant, man, because they want you to think that we're enemies. There's no, there's no enemy. The enemy is not, is not, is the enemy is, is outside of you. It's not nothing to do with the, the next man because he hasn't done anything to you. And that's usually a lack of education. So I always tell people, man, don't judge somebody based on a group or judge somebody based on one individual. You got to, you got to, everybody has to have a one-on-one -on -one with a person to get to know them, you know, and you never know where your blessings are going to come from. So, you know, you guys, I'm going to go over a couple of questions here. And one of the questions was, how was jail? It was hell, man. Every, somebody said one time, hey, did you ever have any happy moments? I had no happy moments in jail. I hated every day of it. I hated it, man. I would, I would be having a dream. I would think I'd be outside on the streets and I'd hear the key, click, 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 click. And that key, man, is, is terrifying. Every day, hear that click key. Get up, you gotta go deal, go to chow, you gotta make your bed, do all the stuff every day. And the other pen, you know, sometimes you hear the, the, the doors pop open and mechanical. That's what you hear every day. Prison is nothing cool. People talking about they were kicking it in there, kicking it, doing what? Hanging out, eating top ramens? You're not making no money, you're not providing for your family, you're not accomplishing nothing unless you're going to school or something, trying to reform yourself. But for the most part, for a lot of you guys, if you ever go to prison, you're going to be trapped in that gang because if you ain't a strong individual, they're going to make you ride. You're going to ride because you're not going to want to say no. And you got all these other dudes with tattoos that are going to be pressuring you, so you're going to be like, fuck it, I'm just going to kick with these dudes. And once you start kicking and eating with them, you're in. You can't break that. So prison was horrible, man. And, you know, people are like, oh, man, you know, it's not. No, nah, man, if you like that type of shit, people are telling you what to do, squatting, coughing, be, you know, living in a, basically you're living in a bathroom with another man. When, when he takes a dump, you got to get on the bed, put a towel over your head. You know, you got to flush. You got to keep flush. I mean, it's horrible, man. You can't spit in the sink. You get your wig split. You can't shower over here. You got to wear your boots to the shower. You got to shower in your, 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 your fucking boxers because you can't go. You ain't, nobody, you ain't walking around with a towel. You walk with a towel to the shower. You're like, oh, man, that dude got a towel to the shower. He on some funny time. Yeah, you, there's a lot of rules, hidden rules in there. You can't be yourself. So prison was horrible, man. It wasn't nothing I liked about it, man. 
Have I ever fought anyone in prison? If so, why and what happened? I had to slap a dude in the cell one time because he was getting disrespectful and he tried to talk loud on a tear. So, you know, you have conversations with people. Sometimes people want to try to put on um, exhibi you know, uh, exhibitions. They want to try to show off. And this dude, I'm like, man, quit talking, man. Come up in here. Come up in here. And he's like, what, man? And can see, when they're outside, the guards can see, and now there's cameras. You come up in the room, there's no cameras. So whenever you, you, ha you have a beef, he's like, just come up in the room. And a lot of dudes, because they can't have their homeboys with them, they don't want to come in the room. So he came in the room. I'm like, you know, what's happening? And then he started talking, and I just slapped him, bow. And he's like, oh, man. I'm like, so what you want to do? And at that point, he started breaking it down. He left. You know, everything was cool. Opened the door, played it off. Didn't have no other problems. Outside of that, I didn't really have a lot of issues with a lot of dudes. A lot of dudes would hate on me. You know, some of my biggest enemies were black guys. I had black guys that were mad at me because I was making money by educating myself and educating others, doing legal work. Dudes would get mad at me. Oh, man, big Herc up in there. He doing legal work, man. What are he charging you? Blah, 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 blah. Black guy's mad at me. But you know what that same black guy would do? He would go to my Mexican cellmate and be like, hey, man, I just got this in the mail. Can you, you think you can help me with it? Now, they know this guy's my cellie, and I'm the, I'm the lawyer. I'm the one doing all the legal work. So he would come to me and be like, you know, look at this. This guy wants you to help him with his legal work. I said, this dude? Oh, wow. Yeah. And this dude would end up paying my celly, who would in turn share it with me. And that's how, that's how stupid it is in there, because of ignorance. You know what I mean? So that's one of the things you have to deal with. A lot of ignorance in there, man. But that's, that's the only time I really had to slap a dude. Um, luckily, I didn't have to get into any like, major, major fights. Because see, the thing is, like, for me, for my size and the way I care about myself, if I got into it with a dude... I'd have to have a blinky because he's going to have a blinky because he's going to try to stick me because I know he's not going to fight me. And most likely he's going to try to rush me with more than one person. So you always have to be thinking and get into fights depending on who he rolls with. It, care, it follows you everywhere you get transferred to. So you leave this institution from a, from a hole or from a lockdown, then you go to another institution. If somebody has homies over there, then the same beef is, it pops back up. So you have a lot of – it doesn't just end there. That shit can carry on your whole bid. Um, what did you have to do to make it out alive? Mentally, I never considered myself a convict or inmate. I never bought into that garbage. When the SEALs would say, hey, uh, come here, hey, Ooh, they call my number. They're like, yeah, you hear me calling you? I'm like, yeah, my name is Mr. Timmons. You call me Mr. Timmons or Mark, but you ain't calling, I'm not no, and they look at, oh, you, you, you better than that? Yeah. Get the hell out of here. They get mad. But I never bought into that whole thing. I didn't walk the yard. Oh, yeah, homie, we were telling these stories, war stories, walking the yard, you know, trying to be gangster or feeding into negativity. I wasn't in there talking about all the stuff, horrible stuff I did, tying people up, doing all this crazy gangster shit. I'd done a lot of gangster shit, man, I didn't get caught for. A lot of stuff, you know. And, and the way I carried myself, it allowed me to kind of benefit because I didn't, pro I didn't promote that and the warden and the guard seen that, so I was able to do a lot of different things that normal people couldn't do. Like I said, I had a study group. I had Mexican guys, white guy, black guy, Belizean dude, Asian. We had a diverse group, and we were able to educate each other, and to this day, a lot of us still keep in touch. We all still network and keep in touch because of the bombs we built in prison and because we got past the racial stuff. The racial stuff is what's going to, that's the end of, like a lot of these guys, the racial stuff kills them. I know, I know Mexican guys in there are smart, man, but they're racial because they're homie and they get out and they can't. Once you become conditioned like that and you get out and you try to snap it, you, you've already been trained. So now you, can't, you don't even know how to interact with a black person. You don't know how to talk to a white guy. You know what I mean? That stuff is what, becoming institutionalized, that's what they're talking about, is the mental. They'll take your mind up in there, man. And um, one of your other questions, did you ever see someone get stabbed? How many wigs did you split? I did see somebody get stabbed. I seen a guy bleeding on, um, I seen a guy bleeding coming from the yard one time. Basically, I think he had owed somebody and he used to go to work and thinking that he can avoid his debt. See, when you owe debts in prison, that's one of the major reasons people get killed. They don't want to pay their debts, people, they'll just kill you. They don't play, they're gonna stab you, try to kill you. It, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, there's no negotiating when you owe somebody. This guy owed somebody and he kept going to work thinking that he can get away with it. The dude caught him right by uh, his work, trying to come into his work, and basically he had a mop bucket and he just busted his head. He had a metal bracket and, and beat the brakes off him. Head was bleeding, he was bleeding out, laying on the ground. And when you see stuff like that, you just keep walking, you walk faster. You don't even look. You don't even want to act like you know what happened or if you've seen something, because the, the police come, they're going to make everybody get on the ground, 
and they're going to question you and you might go to the hole, you're under investigation and you become suspect now. To, people might think you snitched. So you don't want to do, have anything to do with that. Another time I seen a guy, uh, he was in a, coming down a tier and they had a stairwell. A guy had, a, a dude had stuck him with a chicken bone. They had shanked him up. They took a chicken bone from the kitchen. They make shanks out of anything. You get a chicken bone, sharpen it up, grind it a little bit, you know, melt some other stuff around it for the handle. And they caught the dude and they jugged him up a little bit. They were trying to shake him down. His homeboy was a baller and they were trying to extort him for 50 grand. And because they couldn't get to him, they went to his homeboy and stuck his homeboy. And so that was another incident I've seen. And there's a few other spot, places where I've seen people get messed up, you know, guys, you know, out of pocket, they get disciplined. But I have seen a couple of guys like bleeding out. And when you see stuff like that, you know, dude looked up. I mean, he looked at me and, you know, you want to, you can't help him. You can't get blood on you. You can't stop. You can't do none of that. You know, on the street, you're supposed to help somebody, you know, but on the prison, you, you got to just keep it pushing. So, you know, seeing somebody get stabbed, man, you just kind of like, you know, it is what it is. And then before I got to Lompoc, some COs got stabbed, got killed. A dude from D.C., I guess he was like very, he was just like, you know, he was, he was up, he was, he's frustrated. He just like said, hell with it, I don't want to do no more time because he had a lot of time, whatever the case may be. So he came into the chow hall and basically he took two shanks, metal shanks he had got made and he strapped them to his wrist, to his hands. So he was taped up. So basically he just was like going like this and he was just stabbing seals, wop, 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 just stabbing them. Killed, killed, one, killed one or two. I think he killed one and then attempted murder on a couple other ones. They ended up killing him. But the dude was just going off. 12, 15 cops trying to get at him. He just stabbing each one of them. Whoop, 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 whoop. You know what I mean? Blood everywhere. They locked the place down for months. Blood everywhere. Dude went off. You know? But stuff like that happens, man. You never know what's going to happen when you're in jail. You know, it's not no guarantee you're going to get out of there. Um, did you miss your family? How did your family see you after you were locked up? Yeah, that's one of the biggest things you miss in there is your family, man. You know, you think that you take it for granted that your family's going to be there for you. And you think that you're going to be ha have you know visits and all this stuff. Some people don't get visits in prison. I didn't, <coughs> I, didn't, I didn't get any visits. My family, where they lived at, was out of state, and they were not spending the resources to come visit me. You know what I mean? So I didn't see, I didn't get any hugs, and no, no, no family love, no, uh, you know, no vending machine, uh, food, or any of that stuff. The whole time I was down. And I had to figure out how to survive and basically how to stay mentally strong and not just say, you know, to hell with the system and just become institutionalized. So family visits are very important, but a lot of people don't get them. I know some guys that get them, you know, every, every week, you know, or every other weekend, but I wasn't that fortunate. And when I got out, um, and I've never done any dirt to my family. I've never stole from them. I've never done anything to bring drama to the house. I've always done my shit in the streets away from the house. But when I got out, I didn't see my family for probably a year and a half after I got out. I had to figure out, you know, I had to get my shit, I got my shit together, and then I finally met my family at a get together at my grandparents' house. But nobody offered to give me anything. Nobody asked me how my time was. Nobody asked me what I went through. They don't know if, you know, what, what kind of drama I, was, I dealt with, you know. So a lot of times family, you know, act, they play it off and they act like everything's, oh, back to normal. You know, so family sometimes could be your worst enemy. Because, you're, you know, you think that they have your back and they don't have your back like you, they think you do. Sometimes they will. Sometimes some families are forgiving and they'll follow their kid through anything. But there's a lot of times, you know, you get out, you can't depend on family to help you out. You got to man up and do your own, you know, do your own, your own, your own, um, your own duty to get on your feet. You know, you got you to gotta do your own hustling. So, you know, it, it, was, it was, you know, kind of rough getting out. And, but be staying mentally strong and staying positive. Um, how did I feel when I got out? Man, it was the greatest day of my life. You know, when I got out, a lot of guys, you know, they get out and they don't have a plan. Well, I had a book. And like I told you, I used to study in there. So I had like a little notepad like what you have. And I'd write a lot of notes in there. And I'd have one, I had, had multiple different hustles I put in there. Selling cars, um, doing art, personal training. Uh, sales, all this stuff, movies. I'd have all these different things. So when I got out, when I hit LA, I'm like, man, I was excited. You know, I can now try all this stuff that I've basically studied while I was in prison. So I prepared myself. So for me, getting out, it was exciting. You know, what I mean, I was anxious. I was, I was, I, you know, I didn't have any inclination to go back. But a lot of guys, because they watch TV all day, 
you know, they're watching sports, they're watching video, they're watching whatever they're watching. They get out and they're stuck. Oh, man, you know, they don't know what to do. They got to take care of their kids. They got a fiance or a girlfriend or they got to do this and they don't have no hustle. They're just whatever. So preparation is a big thing. But the main thing is uh, just basically not letting yourself get institutionalized. And that's what the biggest things that I always tell people, if you ever go to jail, don't buy into the system because they will brainwash you and they want you to become a basic repeat offender. You know, they don't, they don't care about rehabilitation in there. There's no place to go, man. They spend $76,000 a year housing inmates. That's more than it costs to go to USC. You can go to college, man. Go to college, even if you go to community college, go to college and educate yourself. What did you do after you did your time? After I did my time, I got out. Um, I started working for my friend, did some club promotion stuff. Um, I also got into like uh, personal training, nutritional consulting. So I helped people like with, with diets, workouts, stuff like that. Got into sales, um, like vitamin sales, protein powders, different stuff like that. Um, saved money up, started buying and selling cars. I'm in the old school. I, I bought and sold like Camaros, Mustangs, Chevelles, um, Porsches, all kind of cars, bought and sold cars, hustled that. Um, I started Fresh Out, which is my entertainment business. So me and my business partner have been working on that, trying to get that picked up by a network. So we've been doing that for like the last five years. We got a clothing line, Fresh Out Clothing. We got hats, we got shoes, we got the socks coming out, we got workout drinks. So I've just been, a, I've just been an entrepreneur, man, just been hustling. And that's what you got to be in life. Because I never was the type of person to work for somebody else. I don't want to be somebody else's, you know, boy. I don't want to be somebody else's, you know, worker. Not to say that you got to start from somewhere. You know, you got to learn from somebody to do that and to be a good worker. You learn to be a good worker, you'll be a good boss. So you got to have an ethic. But I've always wanted to be my own boss. So I've, I've been, you know, creating my own businesses. Me and my wife had a clothing line. I've been doing a lot of different stuff, but more or less um, working with my partner, my wife, and just doing our own businesses. So that's kind of like what I'm doing now and doing a fresh out, working on getting the show picked up. And, um, you know, just staying busy, man, staying positive and trying to share positive stuff with you guys so that you don't make the same mistakes I did. You know, there's nothing cool, man, about doing time, man. There's nothing cool about, you know, acting like you're a gangster and all this stuff, man. That's the dudes who do that, who are yelling and lock up, oh, man, yeah, homie, blah, blah. Them dudes are on the streets, cowards. They're scared. They're drug addicts. They can't function. Most of those guys are scared to leave the neighborhood. I know guys right now, I know dudes from Long Beach who never been to the beach. You know, I'm like, damn, dude, you live in Long Beach. The beach is like maybe 10 minutes. You can't have that mentality and expect to make it in this world. You got to think that, you got to see that the world is bigger than just the street, just the neighborhood, just the people around you. You know, you get out, start meeting other people, man. Opportunities will open up. You know, you're not, you're not limited by what you see in front of you especially with all the racial stuff going on, man. They want you to b buy into that so that you, you start hating other people or disliking other people, and it's all propaganda. Don't buy into that stuff, man. Be open-minded. Don't let people tell you what you can and can't do. Get out, socialize, and put together your plan, you know? And sometimes putting together your plan, it might mean that the, the, plan, the first plan might not work, the second plan, the third plan, but it might be the 20th plan that works. You're not going to have success every time you start something, but you'll learn. It's a life lesson, and that's how you got to look at life. It's life lessons, man, and you got to just keep moving forward. Otherwise, you know, you'll be, you'll be stagnant. You know, I never, like the homies I grew up with, I used to bang with, claim the neighborhood. Most of them dudes are busted, man, tore up. Living, you know, hey, what's up? You see me on Facebook. Hey, man, I see you're doing good. And I look at their pictures like, damn, dude, tore up. I don't even want to go around them because I don't want them to try to rob me thinking that I'm doing better than they're doing. So you got to watch the people you're around. You got to look at like, in high school, I know it's different. Middle school, you're thinking, okay, this guy's my friend. But you got to think like five, ten years down the line, do I want to be hanging around the same dude? Has he got the same goals as me? If you want a, a big house in Beverly Hills or you want a Lamborghini and this guy's cool with a Pinto or a, a, a Hyundai, then you guys are going to go different paths. If you want to be an engineer and this guy wants to, you know, work at Target, you know, not to say nothing's wrong with that, but I'm just saying, you got to look at long term. So the choices you make now are going to affect you long term because sometimes you make choices you can't walk away from. You don't want to make a choice. I'm lucky, man. Lucky nobody got killed at the bank. I'd be doing life. I'd still be in the pen. Luckily, we didn't shoot nobody. You know what I mean? If we'd have discharged a gun or shot somebody, anything, somebody would have died. 
accident on a freeway, they'd have blamed it on us. I'd still be in there. I wouldn't be talking to you guys. You know what I mean? I'd be stuck walking around looking like a zombie up in there, just sick. Yeah, you literally die inside. It's sick, man, sitting up in prison. Imagine you up in there and you got, don't imagine, but the guy's in there 40 years, 50 years, and they're sitting around, dude, and they don't know how to get out. Dude, it's, it's miserable. There's no happy moments in there, man. There's no happy moments. So, um, you know, just try to do as many different things you can do as young people, man, outreach programs. Um, whenever you could take a college visit and see different things or if there's a work program that you can get out and learn different trades, man, take advantage of that, man. Take advantage of just all the opportunities you guys have around you because, you know, you, you, when you get older, you realize that Time is something you can't get back. You can always make more money. You can't get time back. I missed a whole decade from 25 to 34. <laughs> I was in there just in there with a bunch of barbarians. You know, I was in there with a bunch of dudes, you know, hanging out for, 10, for almost 10 years. There's nothing to brag about. That's, that's nothing for me to glamorize about that. You know, dudes with tattoos on their face, oh, dude, it, it, it's not, there's nothing impressive about that. It's more impressive to show me, oh, man, I'm taking care of my kids. We just bought a house, and me and my wife are doing traveling. Dude, you're, you're doing it. You're, you're, you're going somewhere in life. You're, my, your kid's in college, or, you know, you're, you're, you're going to get your degree. Man, you're doing it in life. That's what you should focus on. That's what, that's what being a gangster is. Be a, that's being a gangster when you got money in your pocket. You got a, you got your, you're going to work. You got, a, you got a career going. You're out here being successful. That's a gangster, man. A gangster is not the dude who's kicking it, you know what I mean? He's, you know, hanging out. He, he ain't got nothing but a little old apartment and he can barely, and he's sharing it with two or three other homies. That ain't being a gangster, man. Ain't nothing impressive about that. And, and, and worse yet, the dudes in jail who thinking they got something, you're living on a bunk with a mattress about this thick. You know what I mean? And, and it's, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's, your back hurts all the time. You know what I mean? You're dealing with all these other, you have no privacy. There's no privacy in there. You know, you, you got to go poop with, you know, 100 people in a room. Who wants to do that, man? Who, who wants to be around where you can't even, you better not start crying. You get a, a bad phone call, you better hold that shit in. You better walk back to the bunk and just be like, you know what I'm saying? You better hold it in. You know, you, you feel an anxiety, you better, you better get that shit under control. They don't care, man. Guards in there don't care about you. The, the people in there don't care about you. Your homie, he's only in there acting like he cares because of survival. He really don't care about you. He'll steal from you, too. I've seen guys where they have homies, man, jailhouse thieves. They're stealing. They get caught up, and they make their, their, whole, their whole crew now has to get down because this dude stole. Or this dude was gambling, and he owes somebody. So now they got to get rolled up. 20 dudes getting rolled up over one guy. I had a homie in there. His partner, right? was gambling, gambled up a debt, I think five G's or something like that, owed somebody. He called me, oh man, we can't, we can't, at policy, we can't check him in because then we go to another spot, the homie's gonna be like, why you all check in and we're gonna get disciplined. So we gotta either go at it with these dudes or pay off the debt. So I had to send him like 1,500 bucks in jail. He had to get 1,500 from me, 1,500 from his sister, 500 from over here, this and that, because if he didn't have it by the deadline, they were gonna split their wigs up in there. That's what jail is, man. It's a bunch of barbarians, bro. And it's, it's the dudes in there, they're all out for themselves. They don't care. You know what I mean? It's a horrible place. And, you know, being out on the street, man, I just look at the opportunities you guys have, man. It's a lot of opportunities, man. You know, it's got to think about the big picture, man. You know, a lot of, you do a lot of stupid stuff. And think about, like, you know, getting in the car with this dude. You know he ain't got no license. Or you know there's some drugs or gun in the car, man. Little stuff like that. And I was a straight-A student. I made the wrong choices. If I would have been like, you know what, man, I'm cool on, you know, you know selling dope, man. I, I just stick with school. I would have been cool. But I couldn't be here today with you guys, you know. So a lot of my stuff, you know, led me to become this person I am now. But at the same time, man, you guys have a lot of choices. And you got to just pay attention to those choices. You know, do I go over here and kick with this dude? I know it ain't cool, but, you know, nothing's going to happen. Yeah, anything can happen. You guys got to think like, you got to always think like when you, when you think about something, think about five, six other options. Okay, over here, this can happen, this can happen. My mom said I should be home. Okay, the big homie, his brother, I know he's doing this. You know what? I'm cool. I'm just going to go home, you know. Or, and it's not, it's not soft because you don't want to be down. That's smart. Ain't nothing soft about saying, you know what, man, I don't want to, I don't want to participate in this, or I'm, I'm cool, or, you know, I don't feel like getting high, you know, I'm not into that, you know what I mean? Ain't nothing wrong with that. 
That's not soft as being smart, man. You got to think about your future, man. You know, a lot of times people don't think they're going to live past their 20s and 30s. You don't know how long you're going to live in life, man. And you want to prepare yourself so you can enjoy life. You know, you got to look at the big picture. So I hope that gave you guys a little bit of insight, you know what I mean? And, and kind of got your, your, your will spinning because, um, you know, I wish I would have somebody talking to me that was real and rather than, you know, me trying to figure it all out. Because I bumped my head a lot of times. Made a lot of mistakes, man. You know what I mean? I made a lot of mistakes, you know, and, you know, luckily I bounced back from them. But you guys got any other questions? No questions, guys? Nah. Pop it up.